Kalish from Frankfurt. Uh, and he's going to tell us about tropical geometry and logarithmic compactifications of reductive algebraic groups. And he also has uh, uh, let me post a, the raw slides uh, before he marks them up on a Discord as well. And I'll post that in the chat. So Martin, thanks okay. very much for speaking. OK, yeah. Thanks very much for coming. And thanks for having me. I'm happy to talk about uh, math. But I'm also happy to talk about random new things. And this is something I learned during the pretty much the pandemic time. So it's really something a bit new. Um, and um, so, and as uh, Ravi said, uh, please feel free to interrupt at any time when I'm explaining something that looks maybe a bit odd or, or not, but I think most of it should be rather elementary. At least that's what I hope. And if you disagree, you can also interrupt me, of course. Okay, but let's uh, start with something you surely have seen in one form or the other because well, there are too many tropical, or not too many, but there are many tropical geometers around who teach, who tell you all, all the time what tropicalization is. And every time you hear such a talk, they tell you something else, and then you're really confused what tropicalization actually is. But it, in the end, it turns out that most of these approaches are the same. But anyway, um, I'm going to tell you one approach, namely classically, uh, you can just work with um, a um, non Archimedean field extension with residue field at the complex numbers. And for simplicity, we are setting this to be the field of power series with real exponents. And this is a formal um, power series sum um, with uh, over a well ordered subset of the real numbers. And that is sometimes also known as the field of uh, Hahn series. And um, this thing has a valuation. Well, I mean, which we think of as a map from K to R bar, which R, yeah, R bar is just the real numbers union infinity. And I mean, what does the valuation do? Well, you take the smallest uh, sum, uh, the sort of the sum of smallest degree and just send it to the degree of that sum, which doesn't vanish. And at the same time, and that's I think a result of Horn, that's why they're called Horn series is uh, it's true that this is also an algebraically closed field. So it's sort of from a non archimedean point of view, it's more or less everything we want to know, uh, we want to have, it's, it's algebraically closed. Um, the valuation is in fact a subjective map and um, it's also complete that I didn't say, but um, sure it's power series, so it's gonna work. Okay, um, so that's just the setup and that just simplifies a lot of the discussion. That's why we're working with this big, really big field. And um, now um, the notation that sounds much more familiar if you have, uh, sorry, you have, you have here T, just some algebraic torus, and um, we, we are writing N as in the toric geometry world for the field, uh, for the lattice of co-characters and M for the lattice of characters. And it's of course dual to the co-character lattice. And um, now there is a tropicalization map that takes the K value points of that torus, the K is this really big humongous field, and sends it to the vector space generated by the, um, uh, by the lattice of co-characters. So in other words, what should you think of this? Well, this, if you want to choose a basis of the lattice is nothing but K star to the N. And then on this side, this is nothing but R to the N. And the map is the one that takes X and sends it uh, to the coordinate wise valuation. And if you are uh, thinking a little bit or for all people who were just in or who are in Ravi's class on Toric things, you can also just write down, um, yeah, well, I mean, how do you do this uh, um, without choosing coordinates? But in principle, um, that's exactly what is going to happen. So you have this map, it's a tropical, it's called a tropicalization map. And um, well, why do I work with this humongous field? Because secretly, I'm actually thinking of this to be a good enough approximation of a thing called the Berkowitz analytic space. And if you don't know what this thing is, then don't worry about it because at least uh, whenever I'm doing some actual math, I will be working with this object. But in the end, this is a better behaved space that whose points are, I think the same as these, but it has a nice topological structure and all, but um, we're not, we'll not worry about it, worrying about if this is something you don't know. Okay, so that's the tropicalization map for a torus. And um, also notice that this is actually a homomorphism. I mean, um, you have the multiplication, you have addition, it's uh, because valuation is sort of a homomorphism. This is also homomorphism. And um, okay, 
And that's the starting point. And then the next step usually is, well, now let's look at a subvariety of T and study their, tropi their tropicalization of such subvarieties, which is just the image of the K value points of that subvariety in NR. And then with all kinds of results, you get some polyhedral objects and so on and so on, thanks to a result by Bieri and Groves. And the whole um, tropical geometry starts here. And what I'm saying is, um, let's not do that. So today we're not gonna do that. Uh, what we are going to do is ask a very different question. Namely, um, here we have the torus. Well, what happens if instead of working with the torus, we wanted to tropicalize some reductive group? That's really the question I want to, um, well, try to give some answers to in this talk. And um, I realized that at least when I started thinking about it, I did not know what exactly a reductive group was, but I had some examples in mind. And we, I will always talk about the examples when I'm doing actual math in this talk. And the examples are the following. So when I want to say reductive group, what I really should be thinking is uh, GLN. And you should be thinking it as well if you're not an expert in algebraic groups. If you're an expert in algebraic groups, what I'm saying might all be trivial, but that's okay. Um, but um, uh, if you yeah, are saying um, semi-simple group, what you should be thinking is SLN. And when I'm saying semi-simple group of adjoint type, then uh, you should be thinking PGLN. So I'm gonna really work with these notions because it makes a lot of things uh, simple to explain, but all the things I'm saying have equivalents, uh, have equivalent statements also for reductive semi-simple and semi-simple of adjoint type groups. Okay. Now uh, let's get started. Let's introduce a, an interesting space that uh, is, has been around for a surprising amount of time. And um, that's the so-called Goldman Iwahori space. Let's explain what this is though. So um, suppose K is some non-Archimedean field. Think about either the complex numbers with the trivial absolute value or the, this humongous, really big Hahn series field. And um, we want, um, okay, uh, maybe I should actually switch off the Discord thing. It's getting a bit, <laughs> in the, it's kind of annoying in the background when I'm speaking. Maybe this works. Yeah, okay. you, yeah definitely, de definitely don't watch the chat or the Discord. Yeah, yeah, that would Only be- Only bad things will happen. <laughs> yeah, I know, I should not. Um, okay, um, anyway, so we have this another comedian field and V some finite dimensional K vector space. Then um, I want to define what a non-Archimedean norm on this vector space is. Um, that is just a map from the vector space to the non-negative real numbers. That is a positive definite. That means uh, only zero will be sent to zero and that's it. It has to be linear with respect to scalar multiplication like uh, what is written here. And it has to fulfill a strong version of the triangle inequality, the non-Archimedean triangle inequality. And um, that's really the definitions. And now I want to look at sort of the space or for now the set of such non-Archimedean norms on the vector space that is called the goldman Iwahori space in the literature. And um, well, uh, later you will also see that it is closely related to brewer Tietz buildings, but um, for now I will not say that. Um, are there questions? I'm sort of giving a, a, I'm gonna continue with a few more definitions. That's why I wanna make sure everyone is still on board. I guess I'm setting the tone by asking just very basic questions on Discord just to make sure I understand things, but no one seems to have any actual real questions. Okay, good, then I'll continue. Um, so for now, I'd really find this goldman Hori space just as a uh, set of non-Archimedean norms. Uh, there's, a, there's a nice topology on this set. And uh, well, it's the weakest topology is such that the evaluation maps are going to, for each V in V are, are going to be, um, continuous, meaning, well, we take such a norm and evaluate it at a fixed V, and this has to be continuous, and then we take the weakest topology such that this is true. Okay. So far, so good. Um, so what actually is a non archimedean norm? Can you give examples of these, these things? Um, well, I'm going to say, yes, of course you can. In fact, you can give an a, a, a example at work that is sort of, it covers everything, and that's the following. 
actually, I've already forgotten. What, what's your condition on V? I, I, I can flip back, I guess. But V, v was, yeah. Uh, finite dimensional vector space over the non archimedean field. That's it. Great. OK, great. Yeah, I mean, just a finite ve ve dimensional vector space. Great. And um, but and suppose we have we now have e to be a uh, basis of v of this vector space, and we say it's an ordered basis. And we also are choosing a, a tuple of uh, real numbers um, c one up to c n. Then uh, associated to this, we have a non-Archimedean norm that we are going to write, um, well, non-Archimedean norm sign um, E comma C that takes uh, this uh, V to a equal to zero. And what does it do? Well, we take a general vector in here that we write as X1, E1, up to Xn, En. And what are we going to send it to? We're going to send it to the maximum from i equal to n um, of uh, these uh, absolute values of xi e to the ci. And now, um, if you are getting bored, you can calculate that this actually fulfills all the axioms, but I'm telling you it does. And um, well, now we are there. So we have this. We have a, a whole host of uh, non archimedean norms on a vector space. In fact, uh, for every choice of order basis and for every choice of uh, factor C1 up to Cn, we have such a thing. So Martin, and, uh, uh, we have, so you did, what you described as gold, golden air hori space, which is, you know, by its name sounds very old, very long standing, seems to be just the Berkovich. Is that, is your also described? Um, for one dimensional vector spaces, that's actually a true statement. Okay, but there's a, what's the difference in a higher dimensional vector space? Uh, I mean, Berkowitz space is sort of a space of uh, semi norms on uh, uh, on a finite finitely generated algebra, uh, in, uh, uh, this uh, fine Berkowitz space, while this is really a, a space of norms on a finite dimensional vector space. So, in a way, um, whatever I'm writing is sort of the degree one part of Berkowitz space. Well, I was thinking that this is take the algebra to be the to be the uh, polynomial ring. Right? Is that, is that yeah, it? exactly, and that is sort of the degree one part of that. Okay, so so this really is great. Right. So one one should say then that Berkowitz spaces are a generalization of of this earlier notion, which captures more. Yeah, you can say that. Yes, in fact, I mean this goldman hori space embeds into the Berkowitz space of uh, uh, of um, A n, for example. But right. um, the right. big advantage is what's coming in the next proposition, because for Berkowitz space, we can usually not describe what all elements are. But by the following proposition, we can describe every element in goldman hori space. Great. So it, it is something tractable. And the, I mean, the point here is that um, given any such non archimedean norm, there always is a basis and uh, such a vector of uh, coefficients such that this thing is of the form that is uh, outlined above there. So we actually have a handle on really work with to, re, uh, to really work with all the elements in that space, which for Berkowitz space is aside of the very small examples of a one maybe and and like a a two fibered over a one over a tubular value field or something we have really no handle on describing all of the elements in there. While for Gottman Hori space, we can because. Well, it's it's a much simpler space, but it still keeps track of a lot of information we're interesting interested in. Okay, um, let me just be a little bit more precise. It's true that um, that in fact we obtain. Closed immersions in a suitable topological sense from R to the N into this goldman ibo hori space that will take such a tuple of Cs and for a choice of bases sends it exactly to those, um, uh, I mean, to those norms. And then we have this for every ordered basis. So there we go. And I mean, the image of such a thing is called um, an apartment of Gordon in the hobby space. So 
So uh, what you should think of is that this space is um, well covered by uh, copies of R to the N that are glued in a funny but very symmetric polyhedral or fan-like way. So when you and, say closed, um, so when you say closed immersion, it's like a closed. It's like a bijection. It's really an embedding of a closed subset. I mean, okay. sorry. I mean that was a bit uh, too using too fancy language to say something simple. I guess. I no problem. Just making sure. I, yeah, making it, it's like it's a closed embedding. I mean, it's. It, it's the embedding of a closed subset, really. And I mean, um, for people who are familiar, I mean, um, I'm just writing down the buzzword that will be very relevant when you want to generalize it to all kinds of groups. You have to work with this uh, thing called uh, Bruhr Titz buildings that uh, lets you uh, that sort of lets you generalize this in all kinds of uh, other directions. But what we are doing sort of works best for GLN, and that's why we're doing it. Um, notice, however, that um, uh, sort of the, such an apartment um, does not determine the a sort of the tuple e comma c. For example, we could take um, uh, we, we could take sort of we could sort of multiply each of the vectors here by some uh, by some non-zero scalar, and we would get the same apartment. And this type of reasoning um, tells you that uh, these apartments. Right. Can, can I just ask a dumb question here, Martin? Because I haven't thought about this before. Where do these? Can you give an example where these intersect? Besides the really dumb thing. You oh. Just um, let, give me one minute and I'll get there actually. Because I just want to make that point and then we're having an example page. So let's do that. Uh, and I mean, these apartments end up being in one to one correspondence to the Tori um, T in uh, GLN. That's just what I wanted to say. And now let's do examples. Um, in order to do examples um, and to draw things, it's sometimes helpful to notice that, um, well, um, we can always, we have sort of a, a, an operation um, or by um, the real numbers as an additive group or the, non, the positive real numbers as a multiplicative group, just given by rescaling. And uh, well, in, in order to draw things, it's sometimes easier to just mold out by the rescaling action. Okay, and as I promised, now we have some examples. The first one, will lead to a very familiar picture since the question already came up. So if we take V equal to C squared and the complex numbers are now taken to carry the trivial absolute value. So it's uh, really uh, sort of the simplest situation you can imagine. Then um, you have uh, a good collection, a, a sort of a, quite a collection of things. And if you now draw the, the sort of this uh, quotient space that we defined up here, it looks like this. So it uh, corresponds to having um, a copy of the real numbers where, um, I mean, uh, a sort of, uh, you end up getting, um, where sort of uh, at, uh, at this line here, for example, um, you want to say we choose the, the sort of the standard basis of uh, C squared, uh, the one with one zero zero one. And we have uh, C one and C two being the, um, uh, being the, the factors we want to put, but we want to have that uh, C1 divided by uh, C2 um, absolute value is uh, greater than zero. So I mean, in this case, that's kind of a trivial condition unless one of them is zero already. Okay, um, anyway, so that's, um, uh, that's this line. If we had chosen a different basis, we also could have uh, come up here or here or here, but we could have, uh, we could have also found, um, uh, that's what I want to say. This was not what I want to say because these are real numbers, of course. Um, but what um, what else could happen? It could happen that um, let's get the convention straight. It could happen that these two things were bigger than zero, and then um, we end up with this one line here. And here it doesn't matter which basis we have chosen, as long as sort of the first factor is greater than the other, we end up in the same line. So what this uh, what this space looks like is now um, a real uh, uh, a lot of I mean like infinite sort of as many copies um, as there are um, well uh, pairs of basis vectors up to rescaling in uh, uh, C squared 
And for each of them, you get a copy of the real numbers and they're all glued by the, with the sort of the, the non-negative, uh, along the non-negative real axis. And if you're saying this exactly looks like the Berkowitz uh, affine line, then you are almost right because it's uh, sort of, it's the Berkowitz space without all the closed points. So the actual points coming from the algebraic side. And I mean, the more complicated thing would be, um, before I continue with something more complicated, are there questions about this? Is it? I have a question. Yes, yeah. can I ask? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so uh, as much as I understood, we should be a finite dimension of vector space of a non-Hemanian field, right? Yeah. Do you hear me? So, yes, okay, you, yeah. here V is C, C, C square which is the norm here. Oh, sorry, yeah, I said it only quickly. Um, it's the trivial norm. Oh, the trivial norm, I see, I see. I mean, I'm trying to be as explicit as possible. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we are simplifying things. I see, I see, I see, thank you. I still and the, interesting geometry. Uh -huh. And another question. Okay, this is very, very strong, very nice proposition that you formulated for any yeah. finite dimensional vector space that the yeah. situation is like that, it is described in this way. And is it known something in the case when the vector space is not finite dimensional? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, the, my first answer to that is that I have no idea, um, but um, I think it's a similarly difficult question to the, um, uh, the, to the question, um, of what type of topology. I mean, if we are working with an Archimedean norm, um, I mean, you have different ways of finding bases of on infinite dimensional vector spaces according to what topology you choose. So I think this might be a, a difficult, but possibly, um, uh, I mean, there, there is probably an answer to this. If you look in the work uh, in, in, in terms of uh, people who in, the, in, the, in some textbook on periodic function analysis or things like that. But um, I personally do not have an answer to your question because I haven't looked at these textbooks at, as of now. Okay, okay, thank um, you, thank yeah. you. So, sorry, Martin, can I, can I drop a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm just wondering in this case, do we have a re, like a retraction map to some like essential skeleton? Oh yeah, um, I wouldn't call, I'm not sure I want to call it essential skeleton because we'll see later that maybe it's not, but um, uh, but yes, here in this case, I mean, you always have a retraction map to one of these copies of R to the N. Yeah, but uh, if they're in a relation. The yeah, but once we have the retraction, right? In in this case, is there, or in, in this space, is there any like a relationship between this retraction and the tropicalization of Mm, yeah, there is a bit of a relationship. I, I mean, maybe I will answer your question later in the talk, but the point is uh, you only have such a retraction once you have chosen a torus in GLN. So if you choose the standard torus, the one that's just diagonal, then you get the usual retraction that you are well know, that you are uh, might have seen in other talks, but you could have chosen a different torus and then you get a different retraction. Yeah. So I mean, I want to do something that's independent of the choice of a big torus in the in GLN, in, in this example. So um, uh, yeah. that's why I'm I'm not doing that, in fact. Yeah. But um, you're completely right to suspect that, and I mean, um, th it is true that these things uh, have strong deformation retractions onto like uh, things uh, like this. I mean, like copies of R to the N, for example. Yeah, because that's kind of like the motivation for the network media mirror symmetry, right? Like we always have the retraction. Yeah, but, um, there is, yeah, yeah but I anyway. will argue that uh, this is actually a skeleton later. So um, uh, bear with me. So, so Martin, it, it sounds like I, well, I, I was going to ask if I am confused by the picture, um, should I just let it go because it's not going to be so essential? But it sounds like it will be essential and I should ask more questions right now. Is that right? Uh, you should ask more questions. I mean, that's okay. always a good idea. Okay, so I think there is some confusion. Okay, just going back to this from the very beginning, you have C2, you've got the trivial norm, and you have yeah. in this picture, you've chosen a basis. So there's a yeah. basis, uh, uh, is that right? So this is not, this is- I don't know, I mean, um, uh, in this picture, if we choose the basis, the standard basis, we get this copy of R, which is R squared modulo the diagonal, uh, according to this quotient up here. Great, so, and so this is a picture of, everything inside uh, this uh, quotient really so yeah. you should think yeah. of this as being somehow a an r vibration over what i've been drawing and uh, so given a point of that 
What is that special point? What's the norm? Right in the middle? Um, that's the, that's the, the trivial one that sends everything to one, aside of zero. But I thought, uh, I see, oh, okay, great. So we have a norm on C, but this is keeping track of norms on V. Um, right? No, no, no. I mean, um, no. the norm up here is really the, the norm on C squared that uh, yeah. sends uh, every V that is, uh, uh, is different from zero to uh, one. Okay. And so every other, uh, so you're saying every single norm period is going to be in this picture. And from uh, that. Yeah. Um, up, so all, all the, the equivalence class up to rescaling, but yes. Right. And so from that, you can recover. So if I give you a point that's not that point in the middle, you somehow yeah. have a bunch of possible choices of bases. Yeah, and, uh, yes. I mean, for this one, you could have, I mean, as I said, for this one, it's the one that I want to draw in the middle is the one you choose the standard basis and you choose, um, well, um, uh, a two scalar C1 and C2, such that C1 is less than, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, why am I writing one? This is, of course, not, no, it is, it's correct. It's right. We are having the exponential here, such that this is negative. And then you uh, write, um, you sort of take the norm that is of the form uh, uh, sort of um, the one up here, uh, where you have uh, the standard basis with C1 and C2. So great. So what you're saying then is if the basis is not constant away from zero, sorry, not the basis, the norm is not constant away from zero, then from this, you get a basis where yeah, uh, you un uniquely up to scaling get a basis or one of them is going to be sort of bigger than the other by some multiple, and that's yeah. The, I think I did something wrong here. I used I mixed up multiplicative and non-multiplicative language, but I think this is not the confusion. Right. Right. Okay. I think I'm. I think I'm. I'm now good. Um, let me just quickly yeah. check because I think there was there are other people who are less confused than me, but still somewhat confused. Uh, let me okay. just ask. Uh, anyone else wants to ask? This is a good time. Okay. People seem happy. Great. Okay. Good. good. Yeah, sorry, um, um, it's, uh, it's unfortunately a bit of a complicated geometry, but it's much simpler than uh, GLN, I want to argue in this talk. Um, and maybe for the second one, I'm, I mean, something that I barely can draw, but it might uh, remind people of something they might have seen elsewhere. Um, so I'm going to draw it. So if we take C to the three, then I cannot draw the whole space because I'm just not a skilled enough artist, but um, I can draw one of the apartments. So uh, for example, if I want to draw it without taking the quotient, well, it's um, in the end just a, um, um, in the copy of R to the three. So what you should think of, well, choose a basis, then you have the, the sort of three entries uh, in the C that uh, parameterize um, sort of uh, a subspace of that big uh, goldman Hori space. That is uh, just R to the three here. And if we go over to the quotient by rescaling diagonally, you get a picture that might look familiar. That's why I want to draw this. Um, because that thing is, in fact, the A2 root system. Or for people who like tropical geometry or, I mean, toric geometry, it's also the fan of Losef Malin space. And uh, none of these things are a coincidence, actually. So in the previous picture, the apartment was just the vertical line. Exactly. So I could draw all of them because I can draw many lines. But I'm, I'm having trouble drawing sort of many uh, planes in some way. I mean, it still might be possible for skilled people, but I'm not that skilled. So lots of, oh, great. So the apartments in general, somehow most points lie in a unique apartment. Uh, yeah, and, so and in, in this picture, you can think of uh, a big amount of these copies of R2 that are glued in a polyhedral way and, and sort of, and gluing only happens along these one dimensional rays. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, before but I now can say something, in, sorry? In the last example, it seemed like the gluing only happened kind of at some limit points, but was it? I mean, that, that trivial thing wasn't... No, no, no. I mean, um, um, uh, what you should think in this example is you have like a lot of copies of R to the N and sort of the positive part of R to the N or the non-negative part is all smushed to one array. That's this ray above here. 
Does this answer the question? Maybe so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you have a lot of copies of R and you're keeping the sort of the negative parts uh, apart, but the non-negative parts, you are all gluing into one ray. That's, that's the type of object you're looking at. And I mean, um, well, I'm gonna write down uh, the thing for people who know that this is also sometimes known as the blue heat tree in the trivially value case. But um, if you don't know that name, it's okay. Okay, so we have this somewhat complicated object, which has still a beautiful, somewhat symmetric structure. And I mean, it's still polyhedral, even if it's very infinite as a polyhedral object, or as a fan. And I mean, there are a few more properties that I just want to mention. And I mean, these are, um, they're not difficult to show, but they are sort of formal things that we have to have. Suppose we have some non archimedean extension, meaning an, a, a field extension with a non archimedean norm that extends the norm on K. Then we have a natural restriction map from the um, uh, extension of the vector space to the vector space itself. That's just given by, um, well, restriction. Um, okay, that was a, so, so that's that. And, um, and also that uh, that's also important in a way is that there is an operation of GL and K on this goldman Hori space, which tells us that, um, uh, well, what does it do? We have such a non archimedean norm and we operate with some invertible matrix on it. And what do we do? Well, we just take the, the non archimedean norm and uh, pre-compose with the inverse of G. And I mean, the inverse is there to make it into a left operation. I mean, that, that, uh, that's just because it's a bit nicer. Okay, now we have all the ingredients to do to say something interesting or to do something new. And we define a tropicalization map for GLN. Before I do so, are there questions? Uh, can, can, I, can I just, I, I missed the beginning, so maybe you already said this, but like, is everything that you're doing so far, like it just generalizes to general reductive groups, right? Oh yes, it, uh, it generalizes to reductive groups, but I'm for the purpose of being a bit more explicit, I'm trying to work over GLN mostly. Okay. But um, okay. what I'm saying is, uh, well, I mean, what I'm doing for the tropicalization map for GLN is only works for GLN, but then you have to sort of modify it and say other words, and then it works for general reductive groups. Um, yeah. Okay, but does it work for like mixed characteristic? That's a good question. Um, I will have, I will say something about this, but not much. I mean, the, um, as of now, it does not just because I haven't thought about it, but I'm uh, discussing with uh, Lorenzo Fantini uh, how to do it in the mixed characteristic case. And it looks like it's going to work, whatever I'm going to do. I mean. Ah, great. That would be very interesting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, that's why I'm interested in this as well. But um, as of now, I cannot claim we know. I just that it looks like it's going to work. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Maybe I'll ask you some more at the end. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Morning. what is this? Can I just ask you? I, I mean, in, in the Discord, it seems like other people are just as confused as I am. So I just can you really, at a basic level, if I have two different bases, you're yeah. telling me, and I choose the norms for C1 and C2. You're telling me that for you know, depending on the inequalities, those norms are going to be equivalent to each other. Yeah, because um, you have to a strong triangle inequality. Okay, I, that's that's what I didn't get. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, uh, this is sort of one of the first few exercises you do when you do Berkowitz spaces, I guess. And for me, it's too natural. I, I apologize. But uh, having imposing this strong triangle inequality means that you are um, uh, means that a lot of things become equal that you would not expect to be equal, so to say. Um, yeah. But anyway, um, I want to do something uh, fun. So that I mean, in this case, that because this is probably the most fun part actually. So. Um, uh, this is something you can phrase in terms of linear algebra, which I find kind of cool. Um, so you want to have a tropicalization map. Technically, you want it from the Berkowitz space, uh, but um, for our purposes, we want it um, to start in GLNK, where again, K now is this uh, really big field of Horn series so that we are covering the whole Berkowitz space with it. And I mean, what's in there? That's just the matrix. So now, uh, what do we do with matrices of algebraic closed field if we want to find some form of normal or canonical form? Well, the one form that we have is really the Jordan canonical form. So we are now choosing S uh, to be some uh, invertible matrix such that um, 
uh, that such that uh, S inverse, and I hope I'm getting the convention right now, is in Jordan canonical form. And I mean, uh, what that means, if you, I mean, uh, you all might know this, but I'm just writing it down because I have recently taught linear algebra and I'm happy to do so. So it essentially um, uh, consists of these Jordan blocks with some ones on the off diagonals. And as soon as the lambdas are equal, sometimes when you're leaving some zeros out and, uh, uh, and everywhere else it's going to be zero. So, I mean, um, I guess if you haven't seen the Jordan normal form, what I just said didn't make any sense, but I assume everyone has, so that's good. Okay, so it is in Jordan normal form, in particular, I think of A as being diag diagonalizable. So it, this is actually diagonal. Okay, what do we gonna do? We associate a norm to this. And that's the one that takes, um, well, the basis vectors V that, that I wrote uh, in here. So I'll just, uh, for simplicity, write S. And I'm taking the uh, vector of um, all of these uh, lambdas. I mean, sort of just a pointwise valuation of all of the eigenvalues. And then this thing a priori is not in the goldman hori space of C to the N, but in the goldman hori space of K to the N. So you need to restrict it to C to the N, as explained above. So it's a norm, not like you need a norm on k to the n, you restrict it to the subfield c to the n. And um, this is the tropicalization map. A priori, one can make anything up in the definition, of course. I mean, not anything, but a lot of things. But um, as it turns out, um, this, um, I mean, I'm going to give some justification, but I think this is the right uh, way of doing it. Um, if you end up, for example, living in, um, I mean, why is this the right way of doing it, right? I mean, uh, suppose the matrix is diagonalizable, then the matrix actually lives in, uh, a one, in a big torus. So diagonalizing it just means that you are choosing an embedding of the torus into the torus A is living in, for example. And then you're just using the usual tropicalization map, which is given by uh, taking a pointwise evaluation. So this is actually um, why you would come up with that. And if it's not diagonalizable, well, you have to do something that's almost as good. Okay. Let me just say a few words for the experts because I feel like there are experts here. Um, if you are working with a general reductive group, you have to do something slightly more complicated to define the tropicalization. I mean, here, um, I mean, well, I should have said, this is of course going to be the tropicalization of G if G is uh, GLNK. In general, you have to do a slightly more complicated construction. You have to take the brewer tits building of the semi-simplification, so boarding up by the center. You extend this thing by NR for all tori in G. And um, well, you have an integral structure on this uh, on each of the tori, and you define a tropicalization map that is on each torus given by, um, uh, by the usual tropicalization map. And then you have to do a bit of work to show that this actually works. But um, for the purposes of this talk, really think of the explicit way of defining it here for GLN. You try to diagonalize the matrix. If you are successful, you are in a torus, and then you just take the usual tropicalization map. OK. And as I just said, uh, one can make up many things. Is this actually a reasonable thing to do? And the right, so, uh, so, answer is So yes. to, to make sure I, OK, so we're, we're used to doing things like uh, tropicalizing tori, we kind of knew what they wanted to be to begin with. And maybe yeah. a billion varieties we knew too. And now you're saying for all these other groups as well, we now do too. We have to figure out what, how to, what Yeah, I think um, for now, for, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the reductive case just because um, uh, I can prove the next result with, with, with reductive groups. Um, I right. mean, you are, you're wondering where there are other groups, I guess, but um, I- No, no, I, I, I was, why, it was a much more simple-minded question you answered. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm saying I'm, I'm making a suggestion as to how to tropicalize other groups. That's the point of the talk. And then later also something slightly different as well. Like maybe this works for pseudo-reductive groups? Yeah, I don't know what a pseudo-reductive group is, so um, I believe you. It's just, I don't know. Um, um, I have to, as I said, this is something I learned during the pandemic times. So I have not, I'm not an expert in algebraic groups. So um, you might know much more than I do actually. 
Okay, but um, why do I think that my definition is not the worst of all definitions? Um, that's because of the following result, which has a long history. And the funny thing is, um, it, got, it is like as many things in algebraic geometry, it goes back to Mumford. So um, the, the case of a semi-simple group uh, pretty much was done by Mumford already. Then um, using some ideas for, from Brion and uh, Kumar and uh, Martin Studios on the wonderful compactification, which is not what is happening here, but I mean, they have good ideas. Then I'm using a bit of non-Archimedean geometry in the works of Remy, Remy, Thuyer, and Werner. And then I'm combining all these ideas together to get this result. But I, a lot of it has been done by Mumford already. So what's the point? Uh, now we have defined sort of this weird, um, uh, I mean, not this weird, but this, this beautifully symmetric and, uh, piece, uh, and polyhedral um, uh, space called the uh, goldman Ivahori space. And um, well, now we can say that uh, for every rational polyhedral decomposition of that space, meaning that you're choosing in each of the copies of R to the N, you're choosing a fan structure that is compatible with each other when, when things come together. So you're forced to have some, uh, uh, you have forced to have some faces in the fan. Uh, you always have forced to have some of the faces in the fan, but you have some freedom to choose. And for any such thing that you want to choose, and you also sometimes want to put a little bit of a, uh, a sort of a stacky structure in the sense of toric stacks, because sometimes this is necessary too. Then you can construct out of this a, uh, in general, separated, universally closed Dilly Mumford stack that is locally of finite type over the complex numbers. And this thing will be called, uh, well, G bar for um, compactification. And it depends on the choice of the sigma to some extent. Uh, so, um, and I mean, um, and I'm claiming that there is also an open and dense immersion of G into this space such that this thing is a toroidal embedding. And I mean, um, if you notice, know I'm writing a lot of words here and I would have loved to write that this is a proper thing, but it's not because it's not quasi compact, but it has all the other properties of being proper, just that there is sort of, uh, uh, it's not, uh, it's only locally of finite type, but not of finite type. Anyway, so this is a toroidal embedding. First of all, this thing here is smooth if and only if the cones in sigma are generated by a lattice basis, like what you would expect for toric varieties. And this is also a reason why sometimes we need a stacky structure because the complicated symmetry sometimes forces you um, to get some singular cones in there. And by uh, taking the stacky fan structure, you, are some, you just resolve some singularities. And um, you also know that uh, there's sort of the conjugation operation of G on itself that extends to this compactification. Wait, so that's sort of- uh, By then you mean you have a G, act, you have a conjugation action of G on this strange compact, pseudo compactification. Yes. yes, pseudo compactification is a good name. Maybe I'm gonna use that. Um, and I mean, even better, the tropicalization map from the now, I mean, either the big K-valued points or the Berkowitz space is uh, G equivariant under this operation here. And it has, um, I mean, it's continuous. I guess that I should have said that, but um, uh, it also has a section that identifies it with a skeleton of the Berkowitz space, meaning it has a strong deformation retraction of the Berkowitz space associated to the group onto a closed subset that is exactly the uh, sort of this tropicalization of the group that are that or the goldman Hori space in the case that you are working with GLN. So, so the reason for the reductive hypothesis is really just linear algebra in some Yeah, sense. I think so. It's not a, a super fancy pseudo quasi reductive thing. It's like a just linear algebra about the fact that you take that you're like looking at vector subspaces and, and yeah yeah I, I i think i mean what's implicit in all of this is the classification of uh, reductive groups in, in characteristic zero in terms of root data so i mean um, that, oh, that's so you're using root you're using the you know, argument is no i'm not but i'm using sort of implicitly uh i mean if you look at uh um like a, a choice of a torus in there i mean then you take the character lattice that we're doing here i mean and then we take the co-character lattice of the torus i mean uh, that's already part of what's uh, what's needed to classify reductive groups, right? I mean, it's. Uh, 
but, uh, but, 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 your, but your argument seems to be not needing the classification of, I mean, it can't hurt. Oh, no, no, I mean, no, it does not need, but I'm using the same techniques. Um, right. The point is um, that sort of the techniques that show up in there and, and additional toric techniques or locally toric techniques together construct this compactification. Well, well, pseudo compactification. But that classification you just mentioned is only for algebraically closed fields, right? Um, so far, yes. Um, I think we might there might be more to be done in non-algebraic closed fields as well. But um, okay, yeah. okay, that that is your assumption. Okay, thanks. It is my assumption at this point, but I'm optimistic that it can be generalized. But okay, but but, but you're not using. I'm still confused. You're not using classification. You're using linear algebra, which means you shouldn't need algebraically closed. Uh, I mean. Uh, no, I'm not using the classification. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm really using some toric geometry here. Um, but um, I guess I wanted to say it because uh, a lot of the sort of uh, the objects that are used in the classification also show up here. But um, yeah. Anyway, um, maybe I should say a few words on how to actually do that because that's uh, that's really the idea of Mumford now. Martin, the yes. The the dual the the skeleton that you construct is related to the dual complex of your compactification. Yeah, of course, it's the toroidal skeleton in the sense of two years. It's the same. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, and I mean that's I guess also I mean um and I mean that's why I was also slightly um taken a I mean someone asked about the essential skeleton earlier and I'm not 100% sure this is exactly the essential skeleton because the, I mean, I'm not sure what the birational geometry of this thing is. Um, so I don't know what, whether it's minimal or anything and it may be, might not be. If that, uh, that's probably the next question you were going to ask. Okay, um, let me just say, because the construction is surprisingly beautiful. So, um, well, choose an apartment. A in this Goldman Evo body space, and I'm doing the construction only for GLN now. Then we take um, this, uh, I mean, uh, the intersection of the cone complex structure, which is just a fan that we call sigma A. And uh, well, and we write uh, TA for the torus corresponding to the apartment. And I implicitly claimed, or I claimed earlier that the apartments correspond to the torus. Okay, and now we define an intermediate object. It's a partial compactification, which is um, just uh, take the group and uh, you are uh, taking sort of the uh, sort of a push out construction by this is the T toric variety that is given by this fan and you're taking the push out over uh, T R T A. So um, you sort of having what you should think of this is um, you have a torus in G. And I mean, from, in the, with the torus, you can, of course, construct a toric variety associated to a fan and so on. And you're just doing that, and then you're gluing the torus back into the group G. Uh, I should have said that G is probably GLN here. I mean, and I mean, this is, um, yeah, I mean, as I said, I mean, I'm doing this construction, really goes back uh, uh, to Mumford in this case. And I mean, uh, and I mean, it's it sort of, well, uh, you have to do a little bit of work to show that the push out actually exists, but it's, it's sort of a simple enough case. And I mean, the geometry you should have in mind is, well, for every torus in your group G, you are uh, gluing a toric variety to it, such that, um, uh, well, the torus, that, that sort of the, the, the torus of the toric variety, the torus you started with, with are identified. And um, then you are um, taking this object, And you said, uh, well, the big compactification is now just taking the co-limit of all of these things. And the fact that these things um, uh, fit, fit together, that's just because, that's sort of uh, because this whole story is governed by the, uh, uh, by the sort of the, sort of the beautiful symmetric structure of the goldman liu hori space or in general of uh, the Buratitz building. Okay. 
that's sort of uh, just uh, a quick overview of how to prove this. And the question already came, so I answered this next one already is, well, if what happens if you have non-constant coefficients or a characteristic P? Um, well, we're working on it, but you need some slightly more complicated type of buildings, namely affine to a poor tits buildings. And um, since I mentioned at one point, some, people, some of you might know the so-called wonderful compactification of a, uh, well, a semi-simple group. And this is definitely not a wonderful compactification. In fact, it's not even compact. I mean, it's not even proper. It's it's only it's sort of pseudo compact in Ravi's language. Okay, so um, as result I just mentioned, it justifies that whatever I made up is not completely hanging in the air. It's uh, it it might be something that is uh, a sensible notion. Um, are there questions about this for now? It appears we're all good. Okay, they're not. Um, then maybe I'm gonna skip the next part, which is uh, truly wonderful, but maybe not what we want to do here. Um, because uh, you can also um, tell, sort of, you can also sort of look at the wonderful compactification of G and define a tropicalization for this, and that's an, an alternative approach. And you have some nice compatibility between these two things. But all of these things I'm going to skip in the interest of time. And I'm going to talk about something logarithmic now, which I find uh, a much better justification of why one should care about this. OK. Now, uh, log geometry is, um, well, uh, it works uh, with schemes. But these schemes have some extra structure. And they have a sheaf of monoids with them that uh, keep track of the combinatorics of uh, the scheme as well. So you can think of uh, log geometry being a hybrid between uh, classical scheme theoretic algebraic geometry and um, well toric geometry, and the, re and the way to sort of uh, uh, to splice these two things is by adding a, a sheaf of monoids uh, to your scheme that keeps track of the toric data, and that might be sort of the the quickest way of like what can I can say that a log scheme is, and uh, in uh, uh, logarithmic geometry. You now have uh, interesting new groups that are not that were not there before in the in classical algebraic geometry, and um, that's, for example, the group GM log, that is only given as a functor, and the functor is the one that uh, takes a log scheme and associates to it the uh, take the global sections of the monoid and make it into a group. That's the what the functor is, and um, if you do that. You can uh, see that, of course, uh, that um, well, you can think of GM as a functor on log schemes by just taking well the GM of the uh, underlying scheme, and then you get a, a short exact sequence that sends GM into GM log. Well, because if you have an element in uh, O x star of x, it automatically gives an element in here by the definition of what a log scheme is. So you have a map from here to there, and if you now um, Quotienting whatever this uh, GM log uh, is, which is uh, in fact, it's, I mean, it's a group object, so you can take quotients. This thing is normal in there. You get a tropical group object, which uh, is called a GM trop. And that is for this uh, sort of understanding GM log and GM trop, for that I refer to the um, well, uh, beautiful recent paper by Jonathan Weiss and Sam Molko, where I believe that you have, some of you at least have heard something about in this seminar or in, the, uh, in a close by class. And um, well, and I mean, this thing is um, really defined as the quotient. So in other words, we can say that this GM drop is the functor on log schemes that associates such a log scheme, uh, take the sort of uh, this groupification of X and you mod out by OX star. I mean, it's quite literally the quotient. And I mean, this thing has some good prop, some beautiful properties. And um, well, this GM log is a lot of things. It, for example, it is a group by definition. It is proper in a suitable sense. And it is also log smooth. So it has all the things that you want. But unfortunately, it is not a scheme. So it is not represented by a scheme with a logarithmic structure. Um, the way you should think of this is think about a toric variety. It has a big torus, 
And you have all possible um, toric, toric varieties that compactify this torus. And you're wondering, is there a minimal such compactification? And in the world of toric varieties, there is not, but GM log to the N is in fact that minimal proper GM and toric uh, variety. Okay. And, and, and we mean the way to think about this, you can think of the tropicalization, which in this case is just R to the N without any polyhedral structure. So you just, you're just refusing to choose a fan on, uh, on the, uh, uh, for your toric variety. And I mean, that makes sense in the world of log geometry and the resulting thing is GM log to some power. And now that you've seen the proof, you will know what I'm doing next. I'm gonna define a logarithmic uh, pseudo compactification of uh, G just uh, the way we did above in the proof. So let G be a reductive group and so, uh, T be an algebraic so, torus. Martin, I think you're not gonna be surprised by my question, but so uh, presumably this GM, the GM log, which you're saying is not representable. It's not, presumably it's not representable because you just have not, you've yet to, Correctly expand your 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 you have yet to take a mind expanding substance or or to 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 make a more general geometric notion. So there's some things. Yes, there. yes. I think there will be a, eventually there will be a more ge a general geometric notion, and I have seen that Jonathan might be in the audience, and he might be the person who will come up with that uh, geometric notion at some point. Or well, so I hope. Okay, so okay. he's got like a few minutes to come up with it now. Yes, exactly. So that's the okay. problem for him now. No, but I mean, um, uh, the, the reason why it's not representable is just because we don't actually have the right notion um, of, um, uh, of what a logarithmic algebraic stack, what a logarithmic stack actually is. And I mean, at least for the purposes here, or a logo, I mean, it, there's something more general. Okay, anyway, but we're gonna work with this. And I mean, now we're gonna mimic the construction from above. And for every torus in the group G, we just uh, take this push out and just take this as a definition of what this is. And then, uh, well, uh, we glue all of these things together and uh, get a new object, uh, G log. I mean, um, everything makes sense in, in the sense of, uh, well, functors on log schemes. And I mean, it's actually not that big of a problem. Um, one has to maybe notice that uh, uh, well, um, this thing is, uh, if you now want to tropicalize this thing in from the logarithmic point of view, this turns out to be exactly the tropicalization of T itself. And then you can think of just as N tensor uh, GM drop, but that's more just for people who like to work without coordinates. But this, the tropicalization of this thing itself is T drop. And now we take the union of a, over a lot of T drops in this Brewer Tits building uh, type of way. So we can define the tropicalization as the, uh, well, as the union of these G drop T's that are glued the same way we have, we have glued our Brewer Tits building slash uh, Goldman Ivorhori type space. So in, a, in other words, you're looking at the space that you had before without having chosen a, uh, a, a polyhedral structure on it. And um, uh, if you have been following all the definitions and I hope uh, you have seen it somehow, then if we now take the quotient of G log mod G, we get uh, G drop. The unfortunate thing though is that G drop as a tropicalization of that reductive group, it's not a group, it's only a homogeneous space under, under G. Okay, now we have given the definition and uh, sort of from the story that uh, Jonathan and Sam Molcho have developed, a lot of things follow more or less automatically and that's just summarized here and after this I'll stop. So let G be any reductive group over a algebraically closed field, over C, let's say complex numbers. Then this thing is uh, also universally closed. It's separated, it's locally of finite type. In fact, it admits a log et al cover by the compactification, the toroidal compactifications earlier. So, and that, that just uh, proves it all, so to say, um, combining it with the result of uh, Molcho Weiss. And um, you, have, you have sort of a, an operation of G by conjugation. Uh, and I mean, this extends to an operation on this functor and also on the tropicalization and you and 
sort of it sort of by definition comes out that the subjective tropicalization morphism is also equivariant. So it's this is um, on I mean on the level of sort of rank one points. This is exactly what uh, we've been saying above uh, already. And I mean uh, and sort of the, the last bit, which is sort of uh, also in a sense answering a question that Ravi had a, a while ago, is that this tropicalization map is in a way a universal uh, framed uh, GLN torso. Uh, so in other words, it's uh, a, or a universe, uh, it's not a GLN torso, it's uh, a universal framed toric vector bundle actually, meaning the following, that you uh, say you have a toric variety here and you're mapping it to GLN uh, trop. And above it, we are tropicalization, we have uh, GLN log, then uh, you can pull this back and you get a GLN bundle here. And that GLN bundle has, a, has automatically has a faithful uh, operation of the torus and uh, which makes it into a toric vector bundle. So in other words, sort of giving a map from our toric variety into the tropical uh, GLN, um, we can sort of pull back the GLN log living above it and it gives us a GLN bundle which you can identify with a vector bundle. And I mean, there's also a generalization of this to parabolic bundles that I have only checked on toric varieties. But if you sort of take sort of a root stack of this thing and map it down here and pull it back, then you get a parabolic bundle as well. But I should not say these things too much because I mean, those things that are just checked in special cases so far. I mean, this is sort of, uh, I mean, and in my, I mean, it sort of it contains as a special case the sort of uh, um, uh, sort of this mind-bending uh, observation that Molcho and Weiss had, if, if we talk in this case n equals one, so in the GM case, this is just uh, taking a map from, I mean, uh, into the tropicalization, then you take the pullback of uh, GM log above it, it sort of uh, tells you that uh, you can uh, uh, get a line bundle back together with a, uh, a, a choice of, uh, uh, I mean, with, with a choice of torus invariant trivialization on a toric variety. And I mean, that's, that's pretty much that uh, sort of, that underlies a lot of the techniques that worked, for example, also for log curves, where they used uh, this type of techniques to say where to blow up a curve and all of these things. But um, uh, I mean, for that, um, you really have to ask other people at this point, but um, I will just stop here with uh, leaving you with that and asking for questions, of course. So before asking questions, let's uh, pause to thank Martin for his, for his talk.